sono Zaccarias per Sottosopra, per il canale Crisi del Neoliberismo. Eh, Dopo le nostre interviste sul ciclo Unione Europea e Neoliberismo abbiamo deciso di eh, fare un intermezzo con eh, alcune interviste legate alla storia del neoliberalismo, come si è formato, quali sono, quali sono i primi passi, quali sono i protagonisti. Oggi eh, con noi abbiamo una inset che è del BE Norwegian Business School e con lui parleremo del, del suo libro che ha dedicato a al neoliberalismo e proprio la nascita del liberalismo, diciamo, questa micro storia iniziale del neoliberalismo dal colloquio Walter, Walter Lippmann alla eh, formazione della Montpellierian Society. L'intervista quindi verrà fatta in inglese, quindi buon ascolto a tutti. Uh, hi Ola! Ciao Zaccaria, eh, grazie. The first uh, the question is, uh, is a standard question that we... <coughs> What we do to all our guests. What is neoliberalism? A your definition uh, of neoliberalism. Thank you. Yeah, so my definition is that uh, neoliberalism is uh, a political project to make markets the mediators of modernity. And uh, what I mean by that is that neoliberalism as a doctrine clearly has to do with the relationship between the state and the economy, uh, but the project itself and the organization of the Mont Pelerin Society is so diverse when it comes to the details of this project that I think that a definition uh, has to be very broad. Uh, now, we also use neoliberalism as a sort of era in the history of capitalism since the 1970s economic crisis and up until the present moment. But uh, let's leave that aside for now and talk about it as a, as a political doctrine arising in the interwar years. Uh, and it all has to do with the relationship between the state and the economy, between democracy and capitalism. Uh, but since some neoliberals wanted strong competition laws, I'm thinking especially of the German order liberals, uh, and other neoliberals provided the intellectual foundation for the dismantlement of competition law in the US, and I'm thinking now about the American Chicago School, there doesn't really exist any detailed program for the relationship between the state and the economy that all neoliberals agree on. And that's why I think that a definition has to take sort of one step back and say that neoliberalism is a project to make market mechanisms the mediators of modern society. And exactly how to do that, they were never in agreement on. But the nature of that project was nonetheless strong enough to bring together liberals from different national traditions uh, in an organization committed to such a project. And the reason that they could unite, even though they didn't agree on all the details on how to make market mechanisms the mediators of modernity, uh, was because of what they opposed, uh, what markets were supposed to be the alternative to. Uh, and that was economic planning, to a large extent or a small extent, carried through by democratic governments or by dictatorships. Uh, and a lot of their arguments, as I'll go into later, came from opposing dictatorships like the Nazi one in Germany or the communist one in the Soviet Union. But it's also no coincidence that neoliberalism arises as a doctrine at precisely the same time or just after democracy with universal suffrage has its ultimate breakthrough in the Western world. And I think it's easy to forget how recent a development democracy actually is, especially since it's connected to things like the French Revolution in 1789. But in terms of actual voting rights for all adults, it's in the early 20th century that long struggles for this are finally won. And, uh, and this equality of power between all adult citizens pose an enormous threat to the highly unequal order of uh, capitalism. So I do believe that we can see the rise of neoliberalism as a response to this. But it's not only a negative project, it's very much what we can call an answer to the question posed by modernity. And by modernity, I mean a world which is economically intertwined in whole new ways and with pretenses of democracy. How can a world like that be organized? And uh, the various left-wing answers at the time were that this ought to happen through democratic planning, whereas a neoliberal answer was that this modern world has to be based on markets. Uh, so my definition is that this is a project to make markets the mediators of modernity, but that there's lots of heterogeneity within the group or thought collective, if you want to call it that, as to how exactly such a project should be carried through. Yes, thanks. 
guess maybe from my point of view, the, uh, the most simple and uh, the best definition of uh, what is neoliberalism is uh, the solution of the economic, uh, the solution of the political problem by the economics. This is what mm. that one that Leo Strauss uh, uh, says. It's, it's very simple, but we can. Can, yeah, yeah, and I, I think there's there's some truth in that in the because clearly democracy is very difficult, <laughs> and that I mean those are among the best points that the neoliberals made that this is such a complicated project and their idea was that it would never work, uh, but thankfully they would say there are markets. And through market mechanisms, all the diverse preferences and wants of a heterogeneous world population can be balanced almost magically. So, I mean, it's, it's, there's it's a very strong utopian strand in there, absolutely. Hi. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. The rule, the rule of the market is maybe much more in the phonaic vote and in the old liberalism vote. Yes, maybe yeah, after this. Uh, the second question I will ask you is uh, to illustrate as uh, the first step of neoliberalism from uh, uh, colloquial Walter Littmann to the Montpellierian society, which is the first step of the, of the neoliberalism that it is. Well, so the, the colloquial Walter Littmann was a conference in, in 1938 uh, in Paris, which was held on the occasion of the publication in French of a book by Walter Lippmann. It's called La Cité Libre in uh, French, but uh, The Good Society uh, in English. And so Walter Lippmann had been uh, in correspondence with Friedrich Hayek, who, who really was the real uh, mover and shaker of early neoliberalism, both uh, in an intellectual sense, but also in an organizational sense. Uh, and Lippmann wrote to Hayek, I found his letters at this archive in Yale, uh, about how he had been influenced, Walter Lippmann, by the writings of Hayek and of his mentor, uh, Ludwig von Mises. Uh, and so all the people who were invited to this first meeting, and Hayek very much put together, or at least uh, suggested names for this conference, all the people were liberals from various European countries uh, who had been influenced uh, by Austrian economics uh, in this way. And so between that 1938 meeting and the meeting in 1947, uh, which was the first meeting of the Mont Pelerin Society, many of these people wrote books or articles expressing ideas based on Austrian economics and uh, based on Walter Lippmann's use of it in his book, The Good Society. Uh, and so to get an idea of what they were saying, uh, I've developed this sort of concept that I call the dual argument. Uh, which it's important to say is something that I've made up uh, and imposed as an analysis onto their work. They didn't themselves use this phrase, but I think it summarizes how most of them were sort of saying two different things at once, which intuitively can seem a bit contradictory, but that have a certain logic to it uh, once you look at it a bit more closely. And I think that that logic is something of the essence of early neoliberalism as a political program. And so the first part of the dual argument is the thing that the, the most famous for saying, namely that state involvement in the economy or state interference with markets leads to not only inefficiency, but actually to totalitarian dictatorships and civilizational collapse. And then that is really important to have that context of the 1930s in mind. And actually the concept of totalitarianism is how I started being interested in early neoliberalism and even in economics, because before this I studied concept of totalitarianism and the idea that Nazism and communism, fascism and socialism were just two sides of the same totalitarian coin. Uh, and the economic aspect of that idea comes from early neoliberalism and it was developed by these thinkers. And so what they were saying in essence was that really what lay behind the rise to power of dictators like Hitler, Mussolini and Stalin, and what made the three similar was the extent to which they used state power to subvert market mechanisms. And in a sense, this is not so much saying that socialists are fascists as it is saying that fascists are a type of socialists. Uh, because it was through something called the socialist calculation debates, which was a very interesting and long-standing controversy which started in Vienna just after World War I and went on for decades. It was through these debates that the neoliberal understanding of market mechanisms as really the bedrocks of Western civilization and that which made modern society possible 
uh, it was through these debates that that idea was developed. So uh, Mises started already in uh, 1920, arguing that socialists actually had no plan for how to run society or the economy, and that without market mechanisms, it just wouldn't work. And then some socialist economists responded, uh, not Marxists, importantly, but neoclassical economists known as market socialists. They responded saying that, Yes, Mises, you're right. We really do need markets for social coordination in a complex and intertwined modern society. But luckily, we can have markets and market-like structures within a socialist system in which the means of production are collectively owned. And so Hayek entered the debate some years later, and he really refined the notion of not only how important markets are for social coordination, but what it is that they really do, which is that they extract and in some ways even create the knowledge that's needed to coordinate the actions of a multitude of social actors who can't all agree among themselves or sit down and have meetings about every last thing. Uh, so as you can imagine, any sort of state planning then is just not simply not going to work because planners don't have access to and just fundamentally cannot get all this information and knowledge which is generated spontaneously through the market mechanism. And Hayek also noted against the market socialists that their schemes to make market-like structures within socialism uh, were bound to fail without the role of private property and the profit motive. They wouldn't be real markets, he thought, something which I think is worth noting. Uh, and then you can see how this sort of economistic argument blends into political arguments and concerns eventually about individual liberty and so on. And it's expanded onto the argument that Hayek presented in The Road to Serfdom in 1944, that all the incompetence of state planners is what will lead to social unrest, the call for a dictator, suppression of dissent, and so on. But, so it, but the idea is that it all starts with intervening with the market mechanisms. So you would think then that they would just be laissez-faire and against all state involvement in the economy. But that's then the second part of the dual argument which is more muted in publication, but which publications, but which came out strongly uh, at the 1947 conference. And that's the idea that you still have to use the state. And in some ways, this is about providing some sort of minimal social safety net, uh, which was an idea which was gaining acceptance even in these circles at the time, due to the just enormous social problems of the interwar years. But there's also a more sustained argument in there for the importance of state power in a market society. Um, but in short, it was economic planning that they were against, not state action per se. In fact, they realized that they needed the state to have a society based on market, that the state had a vital role in creating the framework for the market economy and even in protecting markets against political interference. So there was actually a strong attack on laissez-faire liberalism implied in early neoliberalism. And sometimes it was very explicit too. I said that the notion of laissez-faire uh, had done great harm to the liberal cause, for instance. And so through this dual argument then, you also have a sustained argument both against social liberalism, the idea that economic planning by Keynesians and social liberals led to socialism, which led to tyranny, and the strong argument against laissez-faire liberalism. And so I think that this, more than the fact that they, they did actually use the phrase neoliberalism every now and then, but the fact that they were actively arguing against both types of liberalism available at the time, uh, that's what makes neoliberalism a very good phrase to describe their project. They really, they really did want a new liberalism, which didn't shy away from using the state like laissez-faire did, but also didn't use the state to subvert the workings of market mechanisms like, uh, like social liberalism did. And so I think that this dual argument was developed more or less in the years between 19, the 1938 Lippmann Colloquium and the 1947 first meeting of the Mont Pelerin Society. And because of the war, of course, they hadn't been able to meet in between. And the biggest difference between the two meetings, I think, was that lots of Americans joined in 1947, most notably Milton Friedman, but also people like Frank Knight and George Stigler, and lots of Europeans who had emigrated to the US during the war years. And by the time then that we get to Mont Pelerin, I think it's important to note that uh, Hayek 
in his welcome speech and in the introduction to the first session, which he said was the most important one, he framed the whole conference as a quest to move beyond laissez-faire and to work out more concretely what it would mean to plan for competition and not against competition, which was a phrase that he used in the Road to Serfdom published three years earlier. It's like he almost wanted a sort of collective effort to find ways of using modern states, not instead of market mechanisms, but in support of them. So there's, there's a level of pragmatism here that they had to accept that the state is an important institution in modern economic life. But I think there's much more than that too. There's a serious intellectual argument about um, the importance of using states, not because markets aren't good, but because of how good they are. Uh, and this is a bit difficult, but important to get our heads around because we're just so used to conversations about politics and economics being framed as if markets and states are opposites. And if you, ha if you have more of one, you have less of the other, which is not necessarily the case and really just the wrong framework for looking at the whole thing, I think. Yes, it's precisely, it's precisely that. Yes, but maybe in um, Margaret, we can see this point of view also in the speeches of Margaret, uh, Margaret Thatcher, speak about uh, strong state and, uh, and, and free society. Is the, is, now, for, uh, for Margaret Thatcher, is, uh, is Hayek the point of view? So maybe in the, in the construction of the of uh, the new line in England by the conservative and the Dutch, we can see a little bit the, these uh, these points. So come back the strong state, the free society. So uh, I, th I think I think you can see it when, when yeah. When yeah, when you know when on. you know what to when you know what to look for, you can see it. But I also think that uh, in the years that. Uh, policies that we can call neoliberal have become uh, important, then the political conversation has been so much about the idea that the state is the opposite of the market. Uh, and so we have gotten used to this way of thinking. Whereas if you go back and look at, at Thatcher, as you said, or as Hayek as I have, you can see that there is actually an argument in there for why the state is an important institution in the market society. Yes, right. The state in, uh, in, you know, in a free market society is also for is also important for uh, uh, for Rupke or Rustov the to the liberals and their construction of a constitutional uh, the constitutional market we can say more easily. But now we go to uh, to, the, to the third question. At uh, <clears throat> the point, uh, it's a point more interesting in uh, your book, I find in your book. So uh, you correctly note, uh, and this is a point uh, of uh, originality respect other other analysis, neoliberalism. You you find that the tension between freedom and democracy is an important issue from the beginning for the, for the neoliberal political laboratory, especially about the risk that the state will begin to respond to all the redistributive choices of, of the interested group, thus increasing the space of collectivist choices. You closely link this point with the tendencies to some inside of the German right and in particular of Carl Schmitt on the theme of the difference between a desirable qualitative totalitarianism, precisely that of a strong state and quantitative. Can you tell us something more about this? We could explain this point. Yes, well, I mean, uh, this is a very contentious point. And uh, so I'm not saying that the neoliberals were Nazis. But since Carl Schmitt uh, was a Nazi, this has become very contentious. Uh, some of the neoliberals actually were Nazis, but that's a different <laughs> that's a different story. Uh, so I'm no expert on Carl Schmitt, but but uh, his idea as an authoritarian thinker on the right under the Weimar Republic uh, was that the state could become captured by the people, so to speak, and that a democracy could lead to the state being used to all kinds of things, chiefly 
social redistribution. And Schmidt didn't like that, and neither did the early neoliberals. So their shared idea was that the state in the age of democracy becomes big, but in their view also weak because it's serving the interests of democracy. And so what both Schmidt and the early neoliberals wanted was a state that might be small, but it has to be strong. Uh, and where the role of the state is not to be a tool for democracy, but rather a protection against it, really. And this view in Schmidt was echoed by German order liberals and, and early neoliberals with, with references to, as far as I'm aware. And the idea is that you need a strong state, but not in order to redistribute wealth and do the work of democracy, which is the idea of the left, but rather for the opposite reason, to protect the state and thereby the economy of, from democracy. Uh, and I, I think that this insistence on a strong state has always been there in neoliberalism and even in libertarianism and other forms of right-wing political thought, which has nonetheless used this language of freedom and even freedom from the state in their propaganda. And I think it's a great shame uh, that they've been allowed to do that, uh, so to speak, because I think that behind the economic freedom of certain groups, there's always a strong state enforcing property rights and uh, locking up the poor people, so to speak. And uh, some libertarians don't even realize this themselves, but in the case of early neoliberals and especially the order liberals, they were explicit in talking about how the free economy needed a very strong state. And a lot of that has to do with protecting market mechanisms from the interference of democratic politics or collective organizing through unions. Yes, thanks. So, yeah. Maybe now we make a uh, we go to Norway. You, you write, you write a book on the neoliberalism in Norway. Maybe now it's uh, so. It's not, when uh, when I when I when I an Italian think uh, the Scandinavian think social democracy or welfare state, uh, and uh, but uh, we can see from uh, maybe in uh, in Sweden or in Denmark. Uh, I know more uh, this, uh, this state. I uh, in the 60s, 70s, it start uh, uh, a neoliberal propaganda, maybe Sweden uh, made by, uh, <clears throat> by Sture Equilson or, uh, or, the, <clears throat> or the young groups of uh, the conservatives uh, in Sweden. But uh, in Norway, how the neoliberals idea come to the nation or how it is how it is spreads in the norway well, so, so this this is a very complex question that i've had to uh, wrestle with quite a lot because when i was interested in neoliberalism and i did the work on neoliberalism as an ideology and to situate it historically in the interwar years uh, but then I stopped, my, my, my book is called 1920 to 1947, so it doesn't actually say anything about uh, the reforms after, which come after the 1970s. Uh, and so uh, what I've come to think is that it's important to separate between the idea of neoliberalism as a political program and as a group of uh, intellectuals and thinkers who form a society and who then become very influential through the field of economics and through this huge network of think tanks, etc. That's one way of defining the term neoliberalism. But then, as I mentioned in the beginning, you can also think of it as almost a period in the history of capitalism since the crisis in the 1970s. Uh, and I think that everyone's always been aware that, that these are two different things and not everything that's happened in the Western world with market reform since the 1970s have to do with Friedrich Hayek. No one, no one thinks that. But still, since we had Margaret Thatcher and she slammed the book Law, Legislation and Liberty in the table, said this is what we believe, it's become a strong idea that actually it's become a, too much of an ideational approach, perhaps. And the sort of caricature would be that uh, Western politicians walked around with uh, Keynesian ideas in their head. And then for some odd reason, they just changed them to neoliberal ideas and they just reformed everything. Uh, but when looking at the history of neoliberalism in Norway, uh, there's no other option than to come to terms with the fact that this has a lot to do with the crisis of capitalism since the 1970s. Uh, because in Norway, there were very few neoliberal intellectuals that really mattered. So I couldn't, I couldn't explain market reforms in Norway with Friedrich, reference to Friedrich Hayek. That makes very little sense. 
And instead, you would see that there are, there's a conservative party and there was a neoliberal movement. There were some people. We had a sort of right-wing prime minister of our own in the 1980s, not quite a Ronald Reagan, but he was connected at some point to a neoliberal business-funded group in the 50s and 60s that translated some neoliberal books. So it's not like it's completely unrelated. That's not what I'm saying. But, uh, but you can't explain the whole thing with ideas. You have to look at what happened in the actual economy. And that's also why there was mainly the Norwegian Labour Party, the Social Democrats, who had built the welfare state, who then went about reforming it in ways that I think makes a lot of sense to call neoliberal because a lot of the thinking behind it uh, definitely, or whether it's conscious or not, but the result at least is very much what I would call the prime neoliberal idea that markets are what makes a modern society function and any sort of planning that democracy has to be under control so that the markets can work. Angela Merkel's idea of a market compatible compatible democracy. And in a, so I'm not saying uh, I used to believe in intellectual history, but now, now I've become a historical materialist. But I think these two things that we have to look at together, we have to look at how ideas play out and we have to look at the context. And we have to study the political economy of capitalism to see why certain ideas become popular at certain times. Which is not, and that's not a mere effect of what happens in the economy. There are all kinds of things. There are there are certainly uh, uh, think tanks and lobby groups working for, which there were in Norway too, working on Norwegian politicians to make them uh, to make them interpret the crisis of the 1970s and 80s in a certain way, so as to answer it with policies that we today can call neoliberal. So these two things uh, work together. That's what I will say. Ah, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, thanks all also for for, for let us discover the, how neoliberalism spread in uh, in uh, Norway. So uh, we have uh, finished our interview. I uh, say thank you for uh, uh, for you come here. Thank you.